Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Today we continue with the sampling topic and we will look at methods called MCMC, which is not the name of some DJ or something, but it stands for Monte Carlo Markov chain or Markov chain Monte Carlo. I think Markov chain Monte Carlo, I think that's the right one. And um, let's see, I think this is where we start. So as a quick reminder, in Monte Carlo methods, um, the goal is to generate samples from some PDF. And so for the step one here, generate samples from a given PDF, P of X, or an unnormalized, typically written P star. Um, that's already a quite a tough problem in itself, how to do it right. Um, maybe when we program, it's not perceived like that because we just generate random data with rand or with rand n. Um, however, if we have some functional form for the PDF that we can calculate, it could be quite difficult to generate samples from it that follow the right distribution. Um, what can we do with such samples? So we can just look at them and see whether some distributions are okay. We can also use it to estimate expectations or to calculate integrals, okay? So here's an example. Suppose we can write an integration of some function phi of x uh, with some density p of x, okay, in that case we can replace the integral with a finite, summa su finite summation where we evaluate this function at those locations, okay. And um, this can be also written like as, as e, where x is distributed according to p. Okay, where were we? Monte Carlo methods, we want to generate samples, and today we see some other methods to generate samples. So far, we only talked about how to generate IID samples, so they are independently, identically distributed samples. So each sample is basically like a random sample from P of X, as it should be. However, also the next sample is independent of the previous samples. And we've seen a couple of examples. There was, for example, the trick with the inverse cumulative distribution function, uh, also called the quantile function. And that was a trick where we basically generate uniform sample from RAND. That's a function that is common in many programming languages. And then we apply some transformation to it, some computation, some nonlinear transformation that turns a uniform distributed variable into something else. And that's like a very nice way to do if you can derive the inverse CDF. We've seen other more general methods, rejection sampling, important sampling, that can also deal with cases where we cannot derive the CDF, where we can only are able to evaluate our P of X, and sometimes not even our P of X, but only P star of X, which is like maybe a function that can be calculated, but from which we cannot integrate over to get the CDF or something. Um, however, there's another option. We can also generate dependent samples, which sounds a bit strange, but when we look at it, um, why not take the current sample? So that's already a good guess, right? So it contains already some information of the P of X because ideally it's coming from the P of X. And why not reuse some of it? So let's reuse the location where it is approximately, right? Is it at 10 to the 15 maybe? And it's that there where my Gaussian distribution or my other distribution is? Or is it at minus five or something? So there's some information contained in the X. And so let's use this x and generate a new one, but conditioned on my previous value. And that sounds a bit strange because at the end we want to have the distribution p of x. But somehow this is generating a stochastic process, like a sequence of random numbers. And that might have a marginal distribution. So the overall distribution, if I shuffle my examples, yeah, might be the true distribution p of x. And so the MCMC method is exactly that. It creates a Markov chain, yeah, so Markov chain, I explain in a second, but very briefly, the new sample only depends on the previous sample, okay? And then I'm, I have to prove that for my proposal distribution or for my algorithm that I'm using, I'm really getting sample from P of X. That will be the mathematical challenge that we have here. So the idea is simple. We kind of have a current value and then we sample again around it and this gives us a new sample, and now we have to find a method, given some proposal, maybe some nice algorithm, that allows us to generate with that one, with that trick, samples from P of X. But so, again, what is the Markov chain? 
So this can be easily seen by looking at the PDF of a sequence of observations or a sequence of samples. So in general, if I have independent variables, then my joint distribution of them will factorize into these single factors. And in this case now, if the p of xi is the same distribution as the p of xj for some other j, we would say it's iid. So it's not only i, independent, but it's also id, meaning identically distributed. But this is the more general statement. Um, however, we, we can have it more general. A joint distribution of n variables in principle using the product rule only factorizes like that. So we have to condition on the previous values. And then for every permutation of these numbers, there will be different factorizations. So that's more a general sequence of random variables, where here the, the ordering um, can be seen that the, the next value depends on the previous ones. Okay, that's a general way to write it down. Question? Ah, okay. Um, yeah, let me, I will answer that in a second. Let me just finish this slide, okay? And then we s s uh, will s flip back to the previous slide, okay? Okay, so this is about going from an IID sequence of numbers to like numbers that are dependent on each other. So that's the most general case where everyone is depending on others, but then there's a special case, the so-called Markov chain, where the next sample only depends on the previous one. Okay, and that's exactly what we are going to follow. So we will have a sample already that gives us some information about the next one. Let me just flip in front. So what is the next one? Okay, so that will be already the Metropolis method. Let's first try to answer your question. So your question is, um, if I have such an integral, so why bother with this form and uh, generating sample from a probability distribution? Why not just equally, equally spaced um, evaluate my integral and then do a numerical approximation. Maybe let's draw a picture so that everyone sees what we are talking about. So suppose I'm having, um, let's say this is my PDF and I want to calculate the area below it, right? So that would be the integral. And then a simple way, as you suggest, is just to take equispaced values and evaluate all those and then basically taking these rectangles and by that we can also approximate the integration. That's a totally valid method in one dimension. Yeah? And so in one dimension these Markov, um, these Monte Carlo um, approaches are not super useful per se, right? Because in principle you can just make this equidistant thing. The only thing might be that um, yeah, it, it, it's of, of course it depends on the, on the size that you choose here, right? If there's a, a very high spike and maybe you miss that one, but that's not a problem, that the random methods will have the same problems. And for comparison, so that would be equispaced numerical integration, and then the Monte Carlo one will look like this. I'm randomly drawing data points. And for those random data points, in principle, I'm having all these columns and I'm summing them up. And in 1D, I would say, maybe I'm a layman in this one because I'm not a Monte Carlo expert, but I think there's no big advantage to do it. However, once we go into higher dimensions, let's say we are in a 10-dimensional space, and then this method with the equispaced um, columns doesn't work anymore because then the number of columns that you get grows exponentially with the dimensions. So in 10 dimensions, you, let's say here you would have taken 100 equispace points. In 10 dimensions, it will be 100 to 10. And so the whole thing blows up and it gets really large. However, with the Monte Carlo method in principle, you can randomly sample also in 10 dimensions. And of course, also in that situation, you are not really covering the old space, but it's maybe you are lucky and it's a bit more promising to try this one because it's kind of adaptively, it goes, it puts more weight automatically to the locations where my function is large, right? And here you just don't know in 10 dimensions. But the Monte Carlo method automatically will kind of sample more likely where it's 
more likely to see data points. So short answer, in higher dimensions, the Monte Carlo methods have advantages. OK? OK, good question. OK, now comes the first method, or that is the main method, the Metropolis method. And there's also the Metropolis-Hastings method, which we will see in a couple of slides. But the basic one is the Metropolis method. And the goal of the Metropolis method is to generate samples from some unnormalized PDF. So we might only have the functional form of it, which is not normalized. It's always a bit weird first that you think, so why is unnormalized such a big deal? Um, there are the mark of random fields, for example. Maybe let me show you. Um, yeah, let me explain very briefly what a mark of random field is. It's basically a set of random variables that is arranged on a grid. And you introduce a graphical model here for this representation. So each of these nodes could be a pixel in an image, for example. And then you say, OK, a pixel is only related to its neighbors. OK? So, and this gives us a so-called graphical model that's very similar to a Bayesian network. However, here are no directions. So here's no directionality. So this is an undirected graphical model. And we would say that a node in here only depends on its immediate neighbors. OK? So given these four neighbors, this node is independent of everyone else. So again, there's some independent statement here. However, what is the density? OK, so that is x1, x2, and so forth. So what is the density of x1 and so forth? And that is now typically a combination of the different densities that we have here. So it, I think it will be a product from i equals 1 to n around all variables. And then we just have some functions, f of xi, given, let's for now say, all the others. But in principle, it will be only the neighbors. So that will be 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that is x7. Then we have x8, x6, 9, 10, 11, 12, x12. So for example, um, ah, OK, now let's write it like this, uh, neighbors of xi. And so for example, the neighbors for the, um, which one is it? For the seventh, va seventh variable. So that will be just the, the 6, the 8, the 2, and the 12. So we also have some locality here. However, this factor here is saying something. If you are similar to the values of your neighbors, then f is large. And if you are dissimilar to the values of your neighbors, then f is small. And that's all this f is saying. So uh, what would be an example? Now I'm making this up. So um, let's say, uh, OK, I don't write an expression now for that one. But that could be just any function that is always greater or equal to 0. And it should have the property that if xi is equal to like the average of the neighbors or something like that, then this thing is happy and gives you a large number. However, that is just designed like intuitive. And we don't care very much whether the product of 12 such functions really integrates to 1. Okay, So here's a big constant missing the so-called z. And the z is the normalization constant that makes it really a density. And it's easy to write out this product for each node, but it's difficult to get this z. And that has something to do with statistical physics. I don't know whether there are physics physicists among you. So this is also called the Zustandsumme. And it has something to do with the Boltzmann distribution and all of these things from statistical physics. So there is something that you can write down very easily, but it's not normalized. And it's very easy to compute. But since we don't have the normalization, we don't really have this p of something. And it's hard to generate samples from it. And for example, in the area of icing models, where you have like magnetization in, in material or something like this, there th things like that play a role. Okay? And there you need these MCMC methods or these Monte Carlo methods. Yeah? So they're very important in physics. But I'm not a physicist, so this is like very sketchy what I show you. However, having an unnormalized PDF is very common in physics. Okay? And calculating the z, 
the normalization constant is super hard because you have to integrate over the whole space of possibilities for that one. Let's get back to the Metropolis method. So we want to sample from an unnormalized PDF P star. And here's the algorithm. Um, suppose now that we have already one sample. Yeah? How do we initialize it? With whatever you like. You can initialize with zero. Or you throw or you from a Gaussian distribution. Yeah? It doesn't matter. Let's just assume we have already a sample. Um, we are not directly sampling xt plus 1, but we are sampling a candidate x prime. And this candidate is either accepted, in that case, the, x, the next one will be our x prime, or we don't accept it, and in that case, we stay where we are. And our next sample is our xt. Okay? So now, what is the condition to accept um, the next <coughs> candidate? So intuitively, we are calculating a probability that tells us whether we should accept it or not. And um, if we draw a picture for that one, and I'm having, a, let's say, my current sample x is right here. And let's say I'm, I'm now having another candidate over there, x prime. Then I could, could check, OK, so my old value had a p star of x, which was quite large. And my new one has a p star of x prime, which is quite small. And then I say, no, that's not a good sample. Let's get another candidate, however I get it. And so if I would get a candidate over here, maybe x prime, I get a p star which is larger than the one that I had. So it's a, it's a good thing to do. So in a way, we are kind of greedily trying to get new candidates which are in an area where my p star is quite large. It's a little bit like a randomized gradient descent, but there's no gradient. But we are just following the function so that to make it larger. So now, how do we do it precisely? Precisely, what we are doing, we are sampling from a proposal distribution. Yeah, and this proposal distribution, on the, on the board, it was I dr I've drawn it already on the board. So it's centered, for example, around my x, and could be, for example, a Gaussian distribution. But it doesn't have to be. It can be any distribution. Yeah, it can be anything, and it is a distribution that we typically call q of x prime given the x. So it depends on my current s, the, the current one that I have right now, xt plus 1, and I'm sampling something new. And so in this case, with this Gaussian distribution, if I'm sampling something on the left side of my current sample, ah, it's an OK sample, but I'm getting into an area where my p star is smaller. If I'm sampling onto something on the right, I'm kind of in an area where I want to get However, I also need samples, of course, from this area down here. So sometimes I should accept also the bad samples. Yeah? So I flip a coin, whether I do it or not. But what is the probability with which I should accept it? And that is calculated using the so-called acceptance ratio. So I basically compare the p star of the new sample of the candidate divided by the p star of the point where I am. Okay? And now suppose my x, x prime is a smaller p star value. In that case, I have a small number divided by a larger number. So I'm getting something smaller than 1. Okay. So if I'm, let's say, in this case, I'm right here, and I'm sending the x prime from my, Q, uh, from my uh, proposal distribution, let's say this height is whatever it is, let's say 10. And this side might be 30. Yeah, then I take the quotient of the new one divided by the old one. And that gives me a 0.3 as the acceptance probability. And then I flip a coin and I say, OK, with 1 third, I accept this sample. Yeah? And with 2 thirds, I'm not accepting it. And I want to do it again. On the other hand, if I'm on the other side, let's say up here, and I'm having a value of 50, then my quotient would be um, 50 divided by 30, which is a number which is larger than 1. So it's not good for flipping coins, because it's not a probability. But in that case, I'm, I'm taking the minimum of 1 and this quotient. And so the minimum will be 1. And then that is the probability with which I will accept it. So if I'm going uphill, yeah, if I'm having a new value which is more likely than my old one, in that case, I will accept it. Yeah? 
if I'm going downhill, I only accept it with a certain probability that gets calculated from my p star. Yeah? So you see that somehow the proposal distribution has nothing to do with the actual distribution p star that I'm interested in. However, then by flipping the coin in between with these ratios here, I'm also using now the p star for my decision, whether I accept it or not. So this is the so-called acceptance ratio. And it's, it can be really interpreted as a probability because it's a number from 0 to 1. And so I'm starting at xt. I'm generating a new candidate from, a new dis from another distribution, q, which has nothing to do with the p star. And then I calculate the acceptance ratio to see how good it is, this new sample. And I will accept it with this probability alpha that I just calculated. In that case, I take the new value. Otherwise, I keep the old one. Yeah? And now, if you just see this, it's just an algorithm to generate, in a complicated way, random numbers. But it's far from trivial to understand that those are really samples from p of x. Okay? And for that, we need some mathematics and some tricks yeah, to really prove that this algorithm generates samples from p of x. It's kind of intuitive, but it's not clear that it fits exactly. However, before we do that, um, let me show you a little demo. Oh, yeah, and that's, as I said, the x0 can be initialized arbitrarily. doesn't matter. Okay, And usually, we have to discard some initial samples, as I show you in a little demo in a second. So if you do that, so this is a picture from the code, um, but I, let me show, the, show you the notebook. So the function from which I want to sample is this, this e to the something function. So that's the one that we've seen already earlier. It's basically the one with the two bumps. So that's my p star. And it's a distribution. It's, a, it's just a function that is greater or equal to 0. And it's not normalized at all. So I didn't care. I mean, I'm also not able to calculate the normalization constant because it's e to the x squared minus x to the 4. So that's like beyond my capabilities to calculate this integral. Maybe some people can do it. I can't do it. So this is my unnormalized PDF. Then I have a proposal distribution. And my proposal distribution is just a Gaussian PDF. But I'm completely free to choose whatever I like. So this is just a PDF. Yeah, and I need it later on for other calculations. For sampling here, I wouldn't really need this function q to be defined. I can just call the proposal one, which is just calling rand n. Okay? However, for completeness, since there's another method, the metropolis hasting method, yeah, for that I also need this value of q. But in this case here now, I only need the right proposal distribution. So now, how is it defined? Okay, It takes some mean. And the mean will be the previous value. So it's just a Gaussian distribution where that is shifted by the current sample that I have. And it's also scaled by the um, standard deviation. But that's a constant parameter here. Yeah? And I can increase it or make it smaller, and we can see what's happening. OK, then my metropolis step is just doing that. I'm having a current value. Yeah? I'm sampling a new candidate here, which is called x1. I'm calculating the acceptance ratio. If it's greater or equal to 1, I immediately accept it. Yeah, that's it. If not, then I flip a coin. Yeah, and Rand is drawing a number from 0 to 1. And so I can ask the question whether this number is less than a. And this is like flipping a bias coin with bias a. And if I'm lucky, I'm smaller. In that case, I'm accepting x1. And otherwise, I'm keeping the old one and returning that one. OK, so let's execute this code. And then there's something fancy for plotting. Um, initially, now, I reset my metropolis sampler. So here I'm just keeping my list of samples. And for plotting purposes, I'm also having y coordinates, because that looks so nice if I can spread them out also in the y-axis. And I can see that I really sampled the right function like uniformly. So this is just for plotting. and. At the beginning, I'm starting with my random proposal starting point. I'm just drawing from a Gaussian distribution with mean 0. And for my y, I'm kind of getting the right value. Depending on the p star at this sampled value, I'm randomly sampling like a location. So far, so good. Let's execute that as well. And now I'm doing the metropolis step, which is generating a new value, calculating the acceptance ratio, and then accept it or not. 
and I can put everything into this picture. So let's do the first step and let's look at the picture. So how do I get this larger? Is there a trick to get it larger? Oh yeah, that was a trick. Okay, there we go. So the blue line is my P star and the orange line is my Q. So that's a proposal distribution. So right now I'm at X0 and I'm having a Gaussian distribution centered at X0 and I'm sampling a new point from it and the new point is X1. And now the height of the point is just randomly sampled, right? So the height here is just uniformly distributed below the blue curve. Great, so that's the first step. When I do the second step, let's do that, um, I think like this. Now my Gaussian distribution is at my previous point, which was x1, now it's called x0 because that's the new center of my Gaussian distribution and I'm getting a new sample from it, okay? And now I can just continue and as you see, the Gaussian distribution is flipping around, is jumping around and I'm sampling new points. Yeah, and so I, I can just go on. And again, note these values here that they go up into the sky here, it's only because I'm randomly sampling the y accordingly, so that I then, if I let it run for a very long time, then I get a picture like this. And you see that it's nicely uniformly distributed below the curve. Okay, so this is like a visual proof that it's working. Going back to the question from the beginning, of course, in 1D we could have equi-space intervals to calculate the integration much easier. However, in higher dimensions, then this, might, this is a better option to do, to calculate integrals. Okay, so this works. So this kind of makes sense. However, we haven't proven it. And here's an, some other issue. So what happens if my proposal distribution is much wider? Okay, so let's say I'm taking a variance of, of 10. In that case, of course, I'm, I can also, let's reset it. Okay, I resetted it and let's run it again. Ah, and here, why does it look like this? If I hard-coded the variance in here? Let me just see. No, the Q. Oh, I also need to change the Q over here. So here I also need to have the default value of 10. So the Q is for plotting and the proposal is for sampling, okay? So um, let's call this triple S equal to 10 and then let's set this to triple S a magic number, okay? So this is the um, uh, hyperparameter of the proposal STD. Good, so let's reset it and let's look at the plot. And as you now can see, my distribution is very wide and my sample is probably off, off the limit here. It's not even in the picture, yeah? So it's a little bit off and um, we won't accept it, so the next sample will be the same one. And so it takes quite a long time. Now we have a new one, okay, great. So that is a new one and we can sample from that one. But it takes much, so by chance we jumped over here. But by chance now, um, most of the samples are rejected because they are like in the, in the very wide area of my orange distribution. So here you see it, it takes much longer. And so let's run it with these parameters for 1,000 points. Okay, it's still looking quite okay, but it might be a little bit less filled than with the smaller variance. So you see the proposal distribution is not completely arbitrary. Yeah? So there are good choices and bad choices. And so if most of the proposals are rejected, then that's a bad choice, okay? So that's the parameter that you need to com maybe need to try and see whether it it's works it works or not so that might be a better parameter with variance of one the other way to visualize it is to visualize all the samples okay so let's plot all the samples so what are we seeing here so here we are seeing x0 x1 x2 x3 x4 x5 and just listed like that and i also connected them with lines because it's easier to to plot like this however also it's a markov chain so one value depends on the other value so now that looks quite nice and it's reasonable maybe that the overall distribution yeah, gives me something which has like, is more likely to be around minus two and less likely to be around two. And just by eyeballing, it looks a little bit like there are more values down here around minus two than there are around two, right? So that is a little bit less. But that's a different way to look at it. 
the reason why I plotted this one is now suppose my function actually is not around the origin where I'm starting with my proposal, but suppose it's like shifted by 10. So my function that I want to approximate is somewhere, somewhere else. So let's plot that one. So basically, um, so why is the plot not working here? Uh, ah, OK. Um, let's do that by hand. Let's say I'm having here 16. OK. So where's my function gone? It should, should show me something. Uh, Maybe I need here the 16. Maybe that's the right one. OK, let's give it another try. Sorry about that. OK, here we go. The function that I want to sample from is now shifted towards minus 10. OK, but my initial proposal is here at the beginning off. So it's not even in an area where my data really is. And especially in high dimensions, in 10 dimensions, it's very unlikely that your initial estimate is right there where the function is that you're interested in. And so what's happening here is, now of course I'm also sampling and sampling and sampling, and it takes quite a long time. And ideally, I'm getting closer. And as you see now, I'm with pressing enough buttons, I got closer, and now I'm filling up the space. OK? Or if I run the sampler like this, it looks the same. But now this plot will be quite revealing. And it shows us that initially, kind of, we have to have quite a few samples. And those might be 20 or 30 samples here until I'm getting into the right area. And so this period here at the beginning is called the burn-in phase. Yeah? So that's like a technical term from Monte Carlo, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, that at the beginning you might be anywhere. But then after a while, ideally, you are kind of getting closer towards um, the area where it's more likely. However, for that to happen, yeah, we need a couple of properties. So suppose my function here is really very small, the one that I want. So this is my p star. OK. And my proposal distribution q of x prime and x maybe starts some, somewhere over here. OK. And I'm starting with the 0, for example. And then I take the next value. Now, those two values, they must have a different p star. So p star of x prime is ideally larger than p star of x, which means this function p star shouldn't be just constant 0 over here. Yeah? If it's constant 0 over here, then I don't have any signal to use. right? Of course, also the quotient gives me a division by 0 if they are really exactly 0. Yeah? So for this MCMC method to work, it's important that this function p star, um, p star of x is greater 0 for all x. Yeah? So that's very important. If I don't have that, then I don't have a signal and I don't have anything. However, if I have that, then I can distinguish these two cases. And in one case, my ratio will be greater than 1, right? because the p star of x prime is slightly larger than the other one. And I will accept that value by that shifting towards the right direction. And the other one, I only accept with a very small probability. So they will be very similar. right? They are similarly small, but this one is slightly smaller than that one, the p star. And then I get maybe an acceptance value of 0 0.9. So it can happen with a certain probability I'm even going into that direction, yeah, with, let's say, 0 0.9. But with probability 1, I'm going to the other direction if I have a sample. Yeah, so those are all important issues in these MCMC. And here you see already it's, a, it, it's easily getting a little bit a black art. So if you have some function like that, um, and your proposal distribution is too wide. It takes very long to generate good samples, so it shouldn't be too large. Um, also, if you are um, far away, you must ensure that the p star is really greater than 0 and giving you a hint in what direction you need to shift your proposal distribution. OK? So there are a couple of issues here. 
And then this plot shows you this burn-in phase where initially kind of you don't have good samples, right? Those are not, not good samples from my distribution. But then after this burn-in phase, the samples that I get are very nice from the right distribution. Okay, so far so good. So any questions about this plots or stuff? Okay, very good. Then let's, let's go on with the slides. We've seen the Metropolis method. Here's the Metropolis Hastings method. And that's a little improvement to the previous one. So before now we said my proposal distribution must be symmetric. Yeah? And symmetric means, um, <coughs> so basically if I swap the roads of x and x prime, yeah, the probabilities are the same. Basically saying jumping forward or jumping backward is equally likely. Yeah? However, um, in the Metropolis Hastings method, yeah, this requirement is no longer there. And the only change to have to get that is to put these proposal distributions also into this acceptance ratio here. So we also multiply like the forward, um, so, so the forward step gets multiplied with the p star of x prime, and then the probability for going backward gets multiplied with the p star of x um, sub t. However, again, why to put it here? We only see when we look in a couple of slides onto the proof why this thing works at all, right? So far, we've just seen the algorithm. I think you understand the steps. And um, the examples in the code look like they, it kind of works, right? Graphically, it generates uniform samples below the curve. OK, so that is the Metropolis Hastings method. And so this is this, like a subtle dis, uh, difference. So now, what could be an exam question? So I like also multiple choice questions. So you could have whatever. A little code snippet, and then you should say, is it the Metropolis method? Is it the Metropolis Hastings method? Or is it the whatever, the injection or injection sampling method, which doesn't exist, or the rejection sampling method, or something like that? Okay, so you should understand these methods. And I think when you listen to the lecture, I think then it's no problem, these kind of questions. Okay, by the way, the Metropolis method is, of course, a special case of the Metropolis Hastings methods, right? Why? Does anyone know? Yes? Yes, exactly. Right. So that's exactly the right answer. So for showing that the Metropolis method is also a Metropolis Hastings method, we can take this, the Metropolis method, and extend this fraction with a 1. And then we replace this fraction with Q of x prime, uh, Q of x given x prime divided by Q of x prime given x, or the other way around. And then we have even really a picture of the Metropolis Hastings method. So that's the reason. Very good. OK, now we come to the point, let's see why it works. And with why it works, I mean, so why are we really getting samples from P star? OK? And let's see what we have. So um, we are trying to sample x primes where my p star is large, right? So this is kind of pushing us towards the area where my p star is um, very likely. Yeah? Um, and it could be that maybe after, after finding one bump, yeah, maybe my, oh, so you can't see this. Maybe my, my true function looks like this. And we start over here and we are getting closer, and then we are happy that we are now in, in this little bump here, right? It's better than where there's nothing, right? And so we are jumping around. However, there are much bigger areas to explore, yeah? And then by in, it goes down here again, yeah? And so we will stay here for a while. So that is quite nice location already. And if my proposal distribution has a small variance, I will stay here. However, with a certain probability, I will jump into the bigger bump. And then I will stay over there for a while and go on and go on and go on. And I will stay maybe even longer, OK? And then, again, I can jump into the much bigger bump and fill that one up. However, if this one now is uniformly filled, at some point, I also have to get bad, right? So because this one might be already covered with thousands of dots, and now it's time again to fill up this one to get the right density. And so with a certain probability, I always want to go where I'm having the highest bumps, but with a certain probability, I also should go back to the areas with the lower bumps. And this is kind of 
built into the mechanism by saying, okay, if you get something better, you always take it. Yeah? So if you get a new sample which gives you a, a larger P star, always go for it. But if you sometimes you also go backward to an area which is actually giving you a smaller number. Okay? And the question is why this exactly fits to get at the end the P star. Yeah, so that's kind of surprising and it's still unclear. Um, so formally we can write it up like this. And this is again getting at the boundary of what we are able to write down. So suppose we are given our P star of x, right? Which means we are given some function that we can evaluate at x, yeah? like for example for the Markov random field situation. And we have some proposal distribution from which we can sample. For example, a Gaussian distribution, I think is, is very common to use that one. Um, then our metropolis hasting methods implies certain transition probabilities. And here I'm staying a little bit hand wavy. Now what are these transition probabilities? They're, those are the transition probabilities of a Markov chain. Yeah, as you know, a Markov chain has an initial distribution to sample the first value, and then it gives you a distribution, given the current one, what is the probability distribution for the next one? And this distribution is not the Q, because the Q gets intertwined with this algorithm where we sometimes flip a coin. So the transition probabilities of our metropolis hasting methods is more complicated than just the Q. However, of course, it's related to the Q. So let's look at the first summand. So the first summand here is about accepting a new point. So here we have a new point xt plus 1, okay, and it was sampled with our proposal distribution, so that's why that's relevant here for my, for my transition probability. But it then gets weighed down with my acceptance probability. And I'm saying here a little bit hand-wavy because I'm saying transition probabilities, but the Q here is a density, okay? And so in a way, this is a new density function for my transition probabilities. However, now it's coming hairy, so what about this delta term here? So the delta term here is there because sometimes I'm not accepti accepting the new value, and I'm just staying where I am, okay? And the staying where I am can happen very often and can also get a large weight. So this point xt gets some delta peak weight, okay? So let me um, draw this maybe on the board. So um, <coughs> to understand what the problem is, let me um, first have another example. So let's say I'm having a random variable and that is just standard normally distributed, okay? And now let's define another random variable, which is a little bit weird. It's just a maximum of 0 and x. OK, it looks quite innocent, right? So that is just um, some transformation of my x, right? But now when you look at the densities, things get strange. So the density of the x looks like that. OK, so that is just the PDF of x. So let's write little p of x. And now what about the y one? Yeah? And that's now where it's getting strange. So this thing will be always greater or equal to 0. Okay? So the density will be 0 up to the 0. And then it makes a jump where the shape is like a Gaussian distribution. Okay? And now the funny thing is that right at the zero, I'm collecting all of these values. So right at the zero, I, I will need a very high peak, yeah, which covers as in enough ground kind of to cover this probability over here. Yeah, so in principle, my density here, maybe this is, so let me draw it like this. My principle, in principle, it looks like that. Yeah, and where the height is, going towards infinity. Yeah? So that's a delta peak. Yeah? And these delta peaks are always a bit strange. Because these delta peak functions, let's say the, the usual delta of x is equal to some infinity for x equal to 0. And 
otherwise it's zero. And it has these strange properties that if you integrate it, it will integrate to 1. Yeah? And that's just how it is. And here we have a similar situation. So this new density here will integrate to 1. However, this area down here is only 1 half, right? Because the area in the Gaussian distribution on one side is only 1 half. So this 0 point here, that must cover the rest. And so this infinitely high thing here, maybe we should multiply it with um, with one half. So the density here in a hand wavy fashion written down will be P of y is basically either y is greater or equal to zero, or let's say greater than zero, and then we will just have the P sub x of y. Okay, so this is P sub y. So for the y's that are larger than zero, we just have the density that we have before, and then we have a delta peak where we have, so if the y is equal to 0, I'm having this infinite jump. And now in my hand wavy way of writing things down, I would multiply this with 0.5. OK. Why? Because if I integrate over this, the summation should be 1. But if I integrate only over the first part, I only get 1 half. And so I'm multiplying my delta peak here with, some, with the remaining probability. OK? This is weird. I don't have a good notation for this one. But it looks like it happens very easily when you just have a Gaussian distribution and you apply a very innocent function here. You somehow get very weird densities. And I think with measure theory, yeah, you have the so-called Dirac measure, which is exactly something like that. And then you can write things more precisely down. But we don't want to do measure theory. So we keep it a bit hand wavy and have this arrow going up to infinity and writing things up like that. OK, so why is it relevant for our metropolis hasting method? Because that's exactly what's happening. So we have a proposal distribution, q of x, and that kind of gets scaled with my alpha of x and x prime, so with this acceptance ratio. I'm scaling this one down, right? So only with that probability I'm accepting that. And the re remaining weight goes to some delta, where I'm basically saying, so the, the new one is the old one, OK? And I need to multiply it with some normalizing factor, OK? However, so the easiest way to think about it is first to see why this might be a reasonable way to write things up. And if you're happy with that one, we use this way of writing things for our metropolis hasting method. So that's what I did. So I wrote it in such a manner that I'm saying, so OK, my new value, let's say I'm accepted a new value. OK, if I accepted a new value, then basically it was sampled from my Q proposal distribution. And I accepted it. So that happens with probability alpha. So I multiplied with probability alpha. OK. However, if I didn't accept it, if I just stayed where I were, that happens if the xt plus 1 is equal to xt. And they have this infinitely high delta peak that then gets scaled with some other probability. And so what is this probability in the back? That's basically 1 minus the integration of this probability over all possible values xt plus 1. OK, maybe I show you that short equation on the board. Let me just copy it. Or maybe I can also, so it's alpha, blah. OK, so maybe I have it in my head. So the first term is xt plus 1 times alpha. So that is the first term that we have there. And similarly, like here, where like the half of my Gaussian distribution doesn't sum up to 1, I can integrate over it, and I get this 1 half, which is like the missing weight. So let's integrate that one yeah, over all possible values of xt plus 1. So there could be all possible values. And this is the weight that is already covered with multiplying the, the proposal density with my acceptance ratio. But then I'm saying, so the missing weight is 1 minus this integration. OK? And that is the one that I will then put in front of the delta peak. OK, let's calculate it. And calculating here really means just 
let's cleverly rewrite it and um, let me see how I'm doing it. I think I can, uh, how did I do this? Let me just check with the, with the thing over here. Ah, okay, so I, let me rewrite the one. I can rewrite as the integration of q of xt plus 1 given xt. Yeah, so I'm just integrating the first entry of my proposal distribution, fine. I can do that, and then I can combine the two integrals, and I'm getting q of xt plus 1 given xt times 1 minus alpha, and that, that one also depends on xt plus 1 comma xt. Yeah, so I'm just changed the 1 to an integration like that, and then I combine them. And this gives me the integral expression on the slide. It also has a nice interpretation because it says, Okay, either I accept my value, and that was the probability over here. If I don't accept it, I don't know which, of the, which was my candidate, so I need to integrate over all possible candidates. And they were sampled with this probability, however, not chosen. So 1 minus the alpha is the probability of not choosing this candidate and staying at the other one. Okay, that's another story how to get that. But I think the easier way to think about it is, um, the blue part here is the one that is easy to think about. Yeah, that's just the proposal distribution scaled down with the acceptance probability. And then I'm having a delta peak for staying where I am. And I need to scale this delta peak basically with the missing, in the, the missing probability value, that everything will sum up to 1. Okay? So far, so good. So this Dirac delta stuff is like the weird part. And the interesting thing is maybe that we need next is only the one that I mark blue. So how can we continue with that one? So for that one, now we need to show the detailed balance. So let me first show, let me explain what we want to show. So we want to show that p of x times the transition probability is equal to p of x prime, the transition probability, the other way around. Where now this transition probability h is the one from the MCMC. Okay, so let's... Before we prove that, let's quickly flip back to what we have. There are three different probability distributions involved here. There's the p star of x. That is the one we want to sample from. Then there's the proposal distribution. That's a Gaussian distribution, one which we, for which we can easily write code for, so to sample from. And then there's this transition probability with this nasty delta term, OK? And that is basically telling us how the Markov chain develops. And now, for this one, now we need to show that the normalized PDF will fulfill the detailed balance condition. And in, in words, it basically says, so if I'm uh, first sampling the x from my true distribution, and then I'm doing an MCMC step, I have a joint distribution of two numbers, and this joint distribution is the same if I do it the other way around. If I first sample the px prime, and then I sample. Or let's say it like that, Let's say the x is much more likely than the x prime, so the p of x is much larger than the p x prime, then basically my Markov chain should exactly invert that. Yeah? So then jumping from the x to x prime should be small, okay? And on the other hand, jumping from the x prime to the x should be large. Yeah? And that's the detailed balance. So the likely values, yeah, for them, it's kind of unlikely to go to lesser li likely values, and the other way around. And that should be just in a balance. And if this balance is given, I can do the following. So now we show that the p of x is a stationary distribution of the Markov chain. And so what does that mean? It means if I start with the p of x and I apply my transition probabilities, and now I integrate this against all possible values that my starting point could have, then at the end, I'm getting p of x prime. So plugging in the p of x into these transitions yeah, will end up with the same distribution, which is exactly the definition of stationarity. Yeah? So if I have a certain distribution over the x, and then I apply my Markov chain one step, then for all values simultaneously, I end up with the same distribution. That is stationarity. 
So how can we sh show that? OK, by detailed balance, the expression under the integration can be also rewritten by flipping the roles of x and x prime. So this is basically going one step forward, and it's the same as going one step backward. OK? And if I have done that one, then I have the px prime, which I can drag out of the integration, because the integration is over dx. And in that case, I'm having a simple integral of h of x given x prime. And of course, this is a probability distribution in its first argument. So this integrates to 1. OK? So the detailed balance basically is the right thing to have. If I have this property, then I'm having proven that the stationary distribution of my Markov chain is the distribution of p. And again, the stationarity, it's also related to this plot that I showed you over there. So here you see a Markov chain of values, yeah? and the stationary distribution is the one that you reach after the burn-in phase. Okay, so these samples here, they are not yet from the stationary distribution. But once I am at the right locations, then I'm in the regime where I'm getting samples from my p of x. Okay, so far so good. So what remains to show is that the detailed balance holds. And even though we have this quite nasty expression with the delta function, we only need the expression for the case where we accept a new data point. If we don't accept a new data point, the detailed balance is fulfilled trivially, as we see in a second. And if we have a data point that has been accepted new uh, from the xt, then we don't need the second term, because then the second term will just disappear. OK, let me show you what I just said in formulas. So first of all, for the case x being equal to x prime, it means I haven't accepted a new data point, but I stayed where I were. In that case, the detailed balance holds trivially, right? Because I can just flip x and x prime. They are the same numbers. Yeah? So that's fine. And that is the nasty case with the Dirac delta. So we don't have to worry about that one. That's good. So we now can assume that x is not equal to x prime, and we need to show detailed balance. Okay? However, if x is not equal to x prime, my transition probability has a very nice form. It's just q times alpha. Yeah? And so it has this, it's only in the first case. I don't need this Dirac delta stuff. So let's massage these terms a little bit, and we end up with the right things that we wanted to show. So how's the massage going? We plug in the expression for the alpha, which was the minimum of 1, and this quotient. And then we see that the front quotient here is exactly the same as the bottom one, the denominator here. So we can drag in this number. And note the product of p and q is exact, is as a greater or equal to 0. Oh, it must be even greater than 0. So it's a positive number, so I can drag it into the minimum. And I'm not violating the rules with the minimum. I just need to drag it into each of the entries of my function. So I drag it into the first one, 1 times the factor is this factor. And the quotient just disappears, and I end up with the top part. And then I'm doing the same operation, <coughs> but now I'm flipping the road. So I'm dragging out the other term here out of the minimum. Again, I'm allowed to do it because it's a positive number. And so the minimum stays a minimum. It doesn't turn into a maximum or something weird. And I'm getting just the other expression. And that's it. So the detailed balance proof is quite simple once you know that you don't have to deal with this Dirac delta case. But then the transition probability is really just q times alpha. And then everything follows very nicely. Note that we replaced here the p star by a p. And that's fine, because the normalization constant would just cancel out in this quotient. Okay, So in principle, the alpha contains the p stars. But then in the p stars, we can get rid of the normalization constants, and then we really have the p's. Or with other words, p star of one point divided by p star of another point is exactly the same as p of one point divided by p of the other point. Okay, So this for a quotient, everything is fine. OK, so far, so good. Any questions? Let's flip back for a second. So basically, the method we are talking about is the metropolis hasting method. And it's a way to generate samples from an unnormalized PDF, where we sample from a proposal distribution, q, 
which even gets a different letter. So that can be anything, and it doesn't have to be super related to the P star. However, ideally, it kind of has the right width, the right variance. If not, then the Markov chain still works, but it takes a very, very long time. The burned in phase can be very, very long. Okay? So if it's like a good choice and the method works quite well, and we can now just sample from our proposal distribution, and now comes the P star into play to calculate an acceptance ratio. So with probability one, we are always going uphill. So if we get a new X where the P star is larger, we always accept it. And if we go downhill, we only do it with a certain probability, depending on how worse it is, how bad it is to go downhill. Okay. By the way, this defines also an algorithm for gradient uh, to replace gradient descent, right? So suppose you have a method where you can't calculate the gradient for whatever new neural network or deep learning method that you are inventing, yeah, and you cannot calculate gradients. In principle, you can do something like that. So if you can calculate your loss function, yeah, and let's say it's bounded by zero, then you can use this as an optimization method. And I think in the last quarter or hour, we will look at exactly that one, how to do that. Yeah, so you can also use it as an optimization method. And it's a random optimization method that will find all the global minima, at least for n against infinity. Because with certain probabilities, you will just jump there on the long run, okay? And you will find them. However, maybe not practically, okay? Because we only have finitely many times. So far, so good. So let's look at two special cases of MCMC. The first one being Gibbs sampling, and the second one being slice sampling. So size, size sampling is just a much more sophisticated way of doing MCMC. And Gibbs sampling is a nice special case where the acceptance probability is always exactly equal to 1. So it's a clever way to define a proposal distribution in certain situations where we accept every single point. Okay, So that's something very useful. So Gibbs sampling. Let's first look at Gibbs sampling for two variables. So now we are sampling in two-dimensional space, so we need x1 and x2, OK? So suppose the joint probability distribution might be difficult to sample from, OK? That might be sometimes the case. It's a complicated product or whatever, and we don't know how to sample from it. However, suppose the conditional distributions are easy to sample from, OK? So that are the assumptions that we need for Gibbs sampling. If we are in a situation like that, then we can use Gibbs sampling. So let's look at it. Let's define the following two proposal distributions. So the first proposal distribution says, update only the first entry. Yeah? So that means the probability of a new point is 0 if I change the second entry. So that one must stay the same. That's why I'm using here the Iverson brackets. And then I'm sampling my, my first entry given like the, and this must be, no, it's, I think it's correct like this. Yeah, given the other coordinate, so I'm having the one, the x1, x2, that is like the current sample. And my new sample is x1, x2 with a prime on top of it. So given like the location, the, two, the second location of the first sampling, sample, I'm sampling now a first entry for the new candidate. Okay? And I can do it similarly, vice versa. So here I'm starting with x1, x2, and I'm getting an x1, x2 prime, where I only change the x1 and not the x2. And similar the other way around. So those are my proposal distributions. For those proposal distributions now, we can calculate the acceptance ratio, and one can prove that it's always equal to 1. And this is only a little bit fiddly, uh, so fiddling here. So maybe uh, let me put it on the board here. So maybe that's confusing. So that's where I am right now, x1, x2. And then maybe I'm going to x prime, which is x prime, which has the two coordinates x prime 1 and x prime 2. So I'm going from here to here. And in Gibbs sampling, I'm starting and I'm either changing x1 or I'm changing x2, but I am never change both. Okay? So graphically speaking, I can also draw a picture. So let's say this is your current location. So this is x1 and this is x2. 
And now by just changing x1, I'm making some horizontal jump, maybe over here. So that is the next point. And then by changing only x2, I'm making another jump up here. So gap sampling is going like that through space. Yeah, so that is an example of gap sampling in 2D. Good, so let's, by now keeping this in mind, that the one with the primes are the new one, the candidate one, and the one without are the current one. Let's look at this equation. So there are four numbers. So basically there's a joint distribution that might be a p star, or it's a p, it doesn't matter because the constant cancels out, of x1 and x2. Those are the two coordinates. And then I'm having my proposal distribution, for example, q1. And now I want to calculate what is this quotient. And I just plug in everything. So I'm having my q1 here, and I'm plugging in this expression. And for that one, I have to be a little bit careful. So the p x1 prime given x2, that is the term at the end, OK? And then I'm having the Iverson bracket in front, OK? So far, so good. Of course, with the Iverson brackets, I have to be a little bit careful. I never want to divide by 0, OK? So ideally, I only write this for the case that x2 is really equal to x2 prime. Otherwise, I would get a division by 0. What do I get? The second term from the q1 and the denominator will be 1, where now the p x1 prime x2 swap their roles. So basically, where the prime went from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. And that is exactly the p of x1 given x2 prime. So the difficulty here is only sub-indices and primes to put them at the right location. So far, so good. So what happens to my joint distribution? I've rewritten it using the product rule, OK? And I did it on the top, and I did it on the bottom for the prime one. So if you are happy with going from the first expression to the second expression, now we can check. So x2 is equal to x2 prime. So the first two values cancel out, OK? So that's gone. And the other ones, they cancel out across. So the x2 is equal to x prime. So the top value up here is exactly as the bottom value down here, and vice versa for the other remaining two values. OK, so the difficulty is only to be very careful with notation. And then it turns out that the ratio will be always 1. And similarly, you can do it for q2. Why is it very nice? Because you don't end up with the things that you have a two wide variance or whatever. Yeah? So just everything works nice in Gibbs sampling if you have these two assumptions that you can sample either, either uh, very simply from the conditional ones and it, the other one might be difficult. Now, of course, you can predict that already. This can be um, general, generalized to several variables, yeah, which makes it really powerful. However, writing things up get really messy. So again, you can write out the proposal distribution now as a combination of d different proposal distributions. You're only updating one coordinate. And um, you can also prove that all acceptance ratios are 1. But you can imagine this was already a mess. yeah. And you have to be really careful with the notation. Now suppose you have x1 to xn. And the same with primes. So it gets really complicated. But it can be shown that it's, of course, also equal to 1. And that gives us a nice method that always accepts. Just as a very brief example, oh, I've, I've erased already the, um, the Markov random field. But of course, the Markov random field is a nice example because <coughs> if I would apply Gibbs sampling to such a grid, it would mean I take that one and I sample it, basically given its four neighbors. Yeah? Because it's independent of everyone else, I can have this pixel and I resample it now given all its neighbors, and that might be a very simple task. Okay? And then I just randomly do it all over the place. And now suppose each of these nodes is not a pixel with RGB or something, but it's just a binary variable, like a flip of a coin. Then you have like magnetization dynamics in physics. So that's exactly this. And they can be simu simulated, for example, by just having these local coins flips with certain biases. Okay, so there's a nice relation to that one. But I think here are no physicists among you, right? So maybe some double bachelor something or interested. So I think once you did computer science and maybe mathematics, then maybe later on you also do physics, yeah, but maybe not. 
Okay, next one, slice sampling. Yet another MCMC method, and it should just show you there are some interesting special cases which have even additional nice properties, and you can be very creative. So this is a picture for slice sampling, and it looks fancy, yeah? So what does it do? So on the one hand, you have you are at a certain location, let's say x0, and then you have some proposal jump, yeah, jump down here, and then you get some, vert uh, some horizontal interval from which you sample. So you first do a vertical jump, and then you do a horizontal jump. And somehow you need to make sure that you are staying under this curve. Yeah? And now this looks a bit like Gibbs sampling, like before. But in Gibbs sampling, this was x1 and that was x2. So now we are back to the other visualization. So that is the p of x. So that is not a second coordinate. So this is now written out as a, so I'm doing a two-dimensional sampling here, yeah, moving around in a two-dimensional fashion under the density function. So that is slice sampling. And why is it called slice sampling? Because I'm always having a slice like this, and from this slide, horizontally, I'm uniformly sampling. Okay, so that's what I'm doing. So here comes the algorithm. I copied it from David Mackay's excellent book, so you can read more about it in section 29.7. And the code goes like this. So I'm at a certain location, and I need to calculate my p star. So that is just giving me, oops, that is just giving me the height where I'm currently am, okay, of the blue line. In the second step, I'm drawing a vertical coordinate for my data point. So I'm getting a new vertical coordinate for my data point, flipping back to the picture. So I'm starting at x0, my p star is up here, and then I'm vertically drawing uniformly a new random location, which in this case is down here. Okay, so that would be my new vertical component. Next, I draw a horizontal component, and let's see how it goes. So I'm drawing like from, I, I need to create a horizontal interval yeah, around my point, some steps to the left, some to the right, and that will be detailed on the next slide, how to do it exactly. And from this interval, I'm drawing uniformly a new location horizontally, and I evaluate it. And with certain probability, or with a certain property, I will say, great, a new sample, or else I need to modify the interval and make it smaller. Yeah, suppose now this is the case. Now I'm right here, and then my interval is going from x left to x right, and I'm uniformly sampling from that one, and I jump. I'm below the blue curve. If I'm below the blue curve, great. I accept it. I have a new data point. If I'm outside of my blue curves, in that case, I need to make my interval a little bit smaller. And I repeat again. Yeah? So basically, that's the idea. I show you a little animation in a second. So here are two steps to, to make more clear. So the first one is, how do I create the horizontal interval yeah? in a clever way? And then how do I modify the interval if I'm jumped outside? And so the increasing size, again, this is code copied from Mackay. Um, basically, I'm um, generating a random number from 0 to 1. And then I'm just going a step to the left and a step to the right. So suppose my random number is 0 0.3. Yeah, then I'm going step size times 0 0.3 to the left and step size times 0 0.7 to the right. This is giving me a random interval around where I am. So the interval could be uh, quite variable. Yeah? If I have done that, I need to make sure that um, I want to be below this p star of x. So I should be smaller than where I am right now. So I'm having this, what is this u prime? So the u prime is this probability of my vertical coordinate. So it will, it's kind of weird that you take the random sample that gave you some vertical one. Now you look at it horizontally, and you compare the, the, the boundaries that you have with these vertical components. And so if you are too large, in that case, you decrease your interval. Okay? And the other way around. That is a bit complicated. Yeah? We can have a look at the code to really understand it. But the main idea is you vertically draw a point, and then you kind of horizontally make an interval from which you uniformly sample. So why is this vertical sampling kind of interesting? Yeah, it could, could mean if you are in this bump, 
that you are right here in the middle and you're drawing from the whole line something uniformly. Suppose you are up here in this area, then your interval, your horizontal interval, will be quite narrow because that's where the function is. You are very quickly outside of your function. Similarly, if you are down here where you are very wide, you can make a much wider step to the right or to the left. So depending on the height under the function, you are making a smaller step to the left or the right, or you're making a wider step to the left or the right. Okay, then it can fail, for example. Yeah, so that is step number eight, that's so this one. So it could happen that I didn't got a new sample, but I kind of was unlucky, and I should make my interval a little bit smaller. Okay, so I should shrink it. And so this is the shrinkage operation. So if I'm kind of jumped out of something, I either take now the, the new value that I have and make it a boundary yeah, or on the left or on the right hand side. Yeah? So basically saying, if I don't want to accept this x1, then the x1 will be the new xl. And so I'm making the interval smaller and smaller. Okay, they are, it's quite intricate, this whole construction. Yeah? And one needs to play around with to understand every detail. What I just want to show you here is that the slice sampling is now a very sophisticated way to generate like an MCMC chain, yeah, to a Markov chain, basically. And again, what do I have to prove that this algorithm really is sampling from P of X? For that one, I only need to prove the detailed balance. So also here, you need to derive the transition probabilities. And it's getting really hairy to do that, right? Because here's about changing sizes of intervals, and you do it vertically and then horizontally. But that's basically what the paper on slice sampling needs to do to make it trustable that it really works, OK? OK, so far so good. Let's look at a quick demo. So here's the implementation for slice sampling. I'm using the same um, notation as before. And basically, what I did here, I implemented all these functions that we've just seen on the slide, and I translated it into Python, OK? So this is the step and out procedure, and this is the step where I integrated basically the step 8a and 8b is in these lines. So here you really can go line by line. Those are really the lines from the slides, and they are translated into Python. OK, great. And then there's some sophisticated plotting method. So let's do that. So let's call it once. So here's my first sample. I first have a vertical sample, which gave me the height of this line. And then I generated an interval xl, xr. And I didn't do any shrinkage. I just sampled from it uniformly, and I got the x1, and I accepted it. Great. Let's do it again. Again, I'm vertically jumped here. I have a new interval x, xl and xr. And I think in this case, I, oh, I accepted the x1 right away, right here. OK? I jump back down here and do a vertical slice and sample from it, and so on and so forth. And with that, you see how you get this nice plot, which looks like JIP sampling under the, in this 2D area. Okay? So and if you run the slice sampler like for a, a quite a long time, then you see that it will nicely sample below the line. Okay? And now, why is the slice sampler, why do something more efficient? exactly for the question at the beginning. In 1D, everything would be simple. But in 10D or in 1000D, sampling is really hard. And then methods like the slice sampler are much more performant than like the plain vanilla metropolis hasting one. So the problem with the metropolis hasting one is, let's say you take an isotropic Gaussian. Yeah? Isotropic means it looks in every direction it's the same. In 1000 dimension, you can really jump out a lot in many directions. And it's very unlikely that you reach an area where your p star is really increasing. Yeah? So it's very likely that it's not increasing, that you find like a use, useless direction. So my intuition is that the acceptance probability goes drastically down in higher dimensions. However, with methods like the slice sampling methods, you, have, you get easier, uh, much easier lots of samples from your distribution than with other methods. So slice sampling is like a nice, sophisticated method that works very well also in high dimensions. OK, so that's the idea of it. Here's another example. So this is just another function with many different um, local optima. And so running the slice sampler works nice. Of course, also the other methods would have worked nice. In one dimension, everything works nice. However, imagine something like that in 1,000 dimensions. 
So you don't know in which direction like the other local optima is. Yeah? And there it might be very difficult to, to generate a good sample towards the other peaks basically, right? But it turns out that the slice sampling performs better in these kind of situations. So far so good. Any questions about Gibbs sampling or slice sampling? If not, then let's continue with the slides. So we look at a paper from Percy Diaconis called the MCMC Revolution from 2008. It's a very nice paper. Let's see, I think I have it on the screen here. So it's a nice paper that is very readable up to a certain point. And it starts with some nice story from some, um, so he's from Stanford. And so you always think in San Francisco of Alcatraz. So there's a jail and there are some people in the jail who are writing, them, writing secret numbers. And that's, I think it is a true story that there's really some secret numbers of some people in jail or something. And they at the Stanford department, they try to decipher it, okay, to find out. And here he explains how to use Monte Carlo Markov chain to find the solution to this problem, okay? I show you an implementation of that one. And when you look at the paper, he explains it very well, so it's very nice to, to read. He also gives a nice brief treatise on Markov chains, which I show you also on the slides a little bit. And then after a while, then section three from cryptography to symmetric function theory, it really changes gears and it's becoming very mathematical. So this is getting like very tough. However, these papers from Pesci Diaconis are always worth a look. Yeah, he's covering many topics. He's also covering this problem of putting disk into a box which is related to putting oranges into a box, which I think was or is an open problem in mathematics still. Yeah? So he like, has, has a very wide span of interest and he knows a lot of things and brings weird things together. So this paper might be a good reason to get into symmetric function theory, whatever that is. Yeah? I don't know it. Yeah? And so it's a very sophisticated mathematician. Um, just Furthermore, he's not only a mathematician, he's also a professional magician. So in his lecture sometimes, he starts his lectures with a ma magical trick for everyone or something. And then it has some mathematical background as well. Actually, there's a nice story. Maybe you should read interviews with him or some books about him. I think he dropped school with 16 or something, with some number, and then went on to become a professional magician. But then at some point, he, um, he got a book from some fellow ma magician about from Feller, Feller who's a big statistician. So the magician said, so read this, and this helps you understand your card tricks better or whatever was the story. And then he got into mathematics, and I think he, he did his whatever high school degree, everything that was necessary, and he ended up at Harvard and becoming a Stanford professor. So it's quite an amazing story. I think I'm slightly exaggerating maybe his story, but so read it yourself, okay? He's a super curious person. I think there are also YouTube videos with him where he's explaining coin flipping and stuff like that. Yeah? He also has paper on how to flip coins. Yeah? So that's, you can also mathematically analyze coins from different countries and see what is the likelihood of getting heads or tails, or how high should you throw, or should you drop it on the, on the floor or not. So he analyzed all these things. So it's really interesting. Uh, the last story about him, if you want to know how to shuffle cards, you should also look at this paper. So here's a paper that this riffle shuffle, I don't know, do you know the riffle shuffle? That's the one where you do this thing, like in movies. How often do you have to do it to get like a good shuffle? And here's a theorem that you have to do it like seven or eight times. And then every card permutation is equally likely, okay? So do never again do this, yeah, when you play cards and you want to have shuffled cards. That's not a very good way of mixing. It takes very long time to make every permutation equally likely if you shuffle cards like that. So learn a riffle shuffle, that's much better. This should make you curious. So how do you prove something like that, right? So that's quite amazing. And so look at his stuff. And uh, I think he's also analyzing um, like mixing like this, yeah, mixing cards like that on a table. You can also define things and make assumptions. So super interesting. I hope I whetted your appetite now. So let's look at this paper here and let's see at my implementation whether it solves the problem. So first of all, um, oh, where's the, where are my slides? Here. So here's a short, short view of his brief treatise on Markov chains. 
So here, here looks at finitely many different states, not continuous spaces, but finite alphabets, basically. And then a Markov chain can be defined by a matrix, right? If you have only finitely many values, we don't have a Markov kernel or something, or we don't have a continuous probability distribution, but we just have a matrix, which is that the x is an n, n many uh, letters, uh, an alphabet with n letters, then the matrix k is an n by n matrix telling us what is the probability, given that I am in state x, what's the probability that my next letter will be a y, okay? And of course, that will also define a Markov chain because I'm only looking at the previous letter from my alphabet, for example. Note here that such a stochastic matrix, every entry must be greater than zero, and it must sum up along the columns or the row, but along one of them, it must sum up. In this case, along the columns, I think. So that means each row will contain a probability distribution. So given that I am in one of the rows, let's say x is equal to 1, I'm having a probability distribution of overreaching y being equal to some other value. And this will define a Markov chain. As follows, we can write out the probabilities. So going from x0 to x1, say I'm at x, and now what's the probability to be at y? It will be just the entry in this matrix. Similarly, if I'm having x0 and I'm not only asking, okay, the next one should be y, what's the probability that then the next one is z? It's just the product of these probabilities here, okay? And curiously, if you now integrate out the x1, yeah, then that corresponds to, so just applying the sum rule, it's, it's corresponding to summing out like the inner dimension of these two matrices. Or with other words, I can also just multiply the matrix with itself. So this is like a matrix matrix multiplication if I'm in a finite state setup, okay? So curiously, if I'm at a certain point and I want to calculate the probability distribution after five steps, I'm multiplying my matrix with itself five times, okay? So I'm taking the nth power of a matrix, yeah? That is nice mathematics. And it's like a super short introduction into Markov chain on one slide. Um, of course, the big question with Markov chains is always, what is the stationary distribution? What is the distribution I'm converging against? And writing it mathematically, it would be, so if I have a random distribution for my x pi, and now I combine it with my matrix, I want to end up with the same distribution. So that's the same expression that we've seen before for the detailed balance, but I had an integration sign over here. But in this case, everything is finite, so everything is, is great. So and curiously, if you write these as vectors, you see that this is saying pi is the left eigenvector of my matrix K. Okay, it's quite fascinating. So we are in probability theory, but once we talk about finite Markov chains, suddenly we have linear algebra, yeah? and we can use all the things that we know about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Yeah? So that's a fundamental theory on Markov chain, yeah, that um, there is such a thing as a unique stationary distribution under very mild conditions, okay? And the mild conditions are something like every state gets reached eventually, yeah? So basically after a while, let's say after doing 100 steps, the probability of reaching every point must be given, yeah? Or let's say you have a drunken sailor that is walking around in Dortmund, okay, then with probability one, after a thousand steps, he's been in every street, okay, so that is his condition. And that's something also called ergodicity. Yeah, that's like a very mathematical description of this fact, which nails it really down. So eventually, every spot in the city will be hit. Or here, after, for some n, yeah, the probability of reaching anything will be greater than zero. I think this must be strictly greater than zero even, okay? And if that's the case, then there is a unique stationary distribution. And it can be shown um, that this is exactly the Markov, uh, the eigenvector of this thing, okay? By the way, you know the power method maybe, that's the method to find an eigenvector, and how does it work? Given a matrix, you apply the matrix over and over again to a vector, and then this vector will converge against the eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue, okay? And this power method is exactly what is written down here, yeah? So if you apply a vector always onto a distribution, eventually it becomes stationary and it won't change anymore, 
Okay, and that's exactly this power method idea. Yeah, so there's a nice link to optimization. Anyway, so let's write down now the Metropolis algorithm for using our notation here from Diaconis. So we have a finite state space, we have some probability distribution which might be unnormalized, that's the one we are interested in. We have a transition matrix yeah, that defines some Markov chain, so that was our Gaussian distribution yeah, in the continuous space. However, here it could be something else, like randomly choose some other letter, if it's letters, or maybe go up to five letters to the left and up to five letters to the right in the alphabet, or something like that. It can be any Markov chain that you like. They are, can be completely unrelated, so the pi and the j has nothing to do with each other. And then we can define the metropolis Hastings algorithm, uh, the metropolis yeah, Hastings algorithm as follows, also as a case distinction like that. And that is now surprising that you can write it as an equation. So now what are we doing here? For the finite case, we can explicitly write down the transition probability of the MCMC, of the Monte Carlo Markov chain, as follows. So it is either the probability of going from x to y, yeah, if I accepted the y, yeah, that means my acceptance ratio was greater or equal to 1, or if I'm smaller than 1, in that case, I need to multiply the transition probability with this probability, and that is the expression that we've seen before in the proof of the detailed balance, or by chance, I just accepted the next data point to be the same as where I am right now, or something normalizing. And now this normalizing expression over here that we've seen here, the summation over all possibilities is whoops, exactly the same as that expression down here that we had. Yeah, so that's the transition probability times 1 minus the acceptance integrated over all possibilities. And that is the same as, where is it? That is exactly the same as this summation. So what do we have here? So we have some operator that takes a pi and a j and it creates an, a k, okay? So given a pi and a j, this is the recipe to generate a Markov chain, yeah? And from that one we can sample. And for this Markov chain we can prove detailed balance. And once we have proven detailed balance, we know it will sample from the right distribution. And that is again the same that we've seen before. Yeah? Basically, detailed balance allows us to replace this expression with the one where we swap the role of x and y. Then we can drag out the pi of y and sum up the rest, which is equal to 1. Yeah? Just for finite sums. OK, so far so good. So this is a different way to write down the metropolis Hastings algorithms for a finite alphabet. And I call it the operator view, right? Because you take a matrix J, you take a, ma uh, you take a distribution pi, and then you want to sample from it, yeah? and to sample from it, now we, we take the J and the pi and get a K. And from the K, now we can sample. And of course, we can ask funny questions. What if I apply for the K again, this operator here? Yeah? I get another K prime, and another, and another, and another. That's something nice to try. I haven't tried it yet, so that might be an interesting question if you are curious. Let's look at the demo. I'm a bit over time, but maybe if you give me five to ten minutes, I can walk you through the code and I show you this nice application. So you can also do it then at home yourself. So it's all using just some basic libraries here. So here's my true text. Uh, you might recognize it. It's some piece from Shakespeare. Okay. So this is the true text, and fine. Let's collect all the letters from the alphabet, including the space. Yeah? So that are the possible letters in here. And now I'm having a function that is generating a random code, and that allows us to get the invert random code. So what is a code? So I'm having an alphabet, and now every letter in the alphabet is assigned to some other letter. So basically, a code is a permutation of the letters in the alphabet. And then the inverse code does it the other way around. Yeah? So let me show how, how you can use it. So basically, I can generate a random code for a given alphabet, and I get the backwards code. And such a code is just a dictionary. 
Yeah, it's a dictionary where I can put plug in a letter and I get the other letter. So that's how it's defined. So I just take my alphabet and I take a random permutation of my alphabet and I zip them together, these two lists, and then I create a dictionary from these zipped lists. Yeah? So that's nice Python code. And to invert it, I take the values of the dictionary that gets in and I take the keys of the dictionary that gets in, I change the order, I zip them and I get a dictionary. So now what can I do? I can write a function encrypt that takes a code, which is some dictionary, and some text. And then I just apply the code to each letter of the text yeah, and join everything together to get a string. So let me show you what it does. So I can encrypt a text with a code and then if I encrypt it again with the decoding D, yeah, I get my text back. And so let's run the code. So the starting point is the true text, which is just this one. Then I have the encrypted version of it, which is now this gibberish. And finally, I take the encrypted version and I pl apply the dictionary the other way around, and I get my text back. Okay? So far, so good. Everything works very nice. So now, what is my true distribution pi? My unnormalized true distribution pi. So how do we get there? So for that, we are counting n-grams in English texts. Okay? And what is an n-gram? So a 1-gram is just counting how many e's are there, what's the probability of seeing an e, how, what's the probability of seeing an a. So a 1-gram is just looking at single letters and calculating a probability distribution over it. A 2-gram or a bigram is looking at pairs of letters yeah, and having a probability distribution over all possible pairs. So if I do this for war and peace from some translation, I can, can have a look at the, at the, the 1D, well, why is it? Okay, I should choose here a 1. I get such a probability distribution over the letters. Okay, it looks like the most likely letter is the space, and the second most likely letter is the E. Yeah, and these numbers here, they correspond, I think, approximately to the points, inversely to the points that you get in Scrabble, in the English version. Okay, so that is a 1 gram. And it gives me a probability distribution because now I can apply this one gram yeah, to my text. And I can calculate for each letter in my text, I can calculate how likely it is and I can multiply all of these numbers. And I'm taking the logarithms to sum stuff up. That's why I'm looking at the log plausibility. And it's not called a probability because it's not normalized. Okay? I don't care for these things. Similarly, I could look at bigrams. So let's say n equals 2. And so the implementation here is quite sophisticated, so you can have 3 grams, 4 grams, 5 grams, and so on. So in that case, I'm not getting a plot that we've just seen, but instead, whoops, ah, where is it? I did press the wrong one, so now again. So I get a 2D matrix like that. Why is it not showing up completely? There it is. So I'm having the first letter, and then I'm having the second letter. And so I could say, after a Q, it's very likely that I see a U. Okay, that's why I see such a dark hit here. Similarly for the E, the E has many entries. So after an H, it's very likely that I see an E. Or after a V, it's even more likely to see an E. Okay, so that is a transition probability now. It's a bigram model of the English language. Yeah? And of course, similarly, I could also have a trigram model for the English language, where I'm having an e e even larger object, okay? Okay, now having a unigram or a bigram or a threegram model, I can define the log probability of a given text. So think of this one here, the one, um, the gibberish one. If I calculate its plausibility, it will be very low because the distribution of the E's is wrong, right? So there are not enough E's compared to the other ones. Also, if I calculate the bigram model, it's not very good because, like, it's not very likely that um, there's a X and then a Q is following or something. Or that surprisingly, there's a Q followed by the U, but here's a Q followed by the L. That is very unlikely, okay? So the distribution is just not very, very good. However, if I apply this plausibility to the correct one, to the Shakespeare original, then the plausibility will be quite large. So now what do we get? We now have a pi, yeah? So that is our pi here our probability on x, 
but for whole texts. And I can calculate it. Why is it good to calculate it? Because then I can calculate my acceptance probabilities. And now what is my transition probability, my random jump? I'm just swapping two letters in my dictionary. So I'm randomly swapping letters, and I see whether my pi of x gets more happy or not. And sometimes I'm also going downhill. So that was the n-gram thing and the plausibility. And the random flip is just taking two entries in my dictionary and flipping them. Okay, so that's it. So here comes the MCMC method. So I'm starting with some random guess, which is a random code. Yeah, and I can decrypt it with my random code and calculate its log plausibility. And that one will be very low at the beginning because it's just some random assignment. But then I go on. I modify my random code with a flip. Again, I calculate the log plausibility. And if I'm now having a higher log plausibility, then I say, OK, that flip was a good one. OK, I keep it. However, with a certain with, with probability 1, I will always accept it if I'm having a larger plausibility. And with a random flip of a coin, I will accept it if it has a lower probability. It looks a little bit more complicated here with the exponential function, but that's just because I'm not having probabilities, but log probabilities calculated. That's why I'm having the E function here. OK, and if I let it run, it should work, ideally. So let's run it for the, um, let's say, the bigram model. OK, so that's my bigram model. Let's run it. And then you will see that So it's generating at the beginning, like the plausibility is 3,500, whatever that means. And then it's going up, 4,300, and the text changes. And it goes on and on and on and on. And ideally, at the end, I'm reaching to be or not to be. However, this has a truth marker. So this is the true solution. So the last solution that is actually was generated is that one. So it looks a little bit more like English but not perfect yet. Yeah? At least I'm kind of getting the right distribution with the age. So let's increase the number of iterations, for example. I can do that. Fine. Let's, let's run it again. And let's see whether we are more lucky now. And here we get, at the end, closer. No C or ton, no C, and then is. It kind of looks like it, but it's not very good yet. So let's improve our model. Let's make it a trigram model. So I can do it just by saying here 3. And then I think it should be done much faster. So OK, let's let it run for 1,000 steps, uh, 10,000 steps. And let's hope for the best. So at the beginning, again, it's just gliberish. But then it should improve. And it didn't improve enough. OK, that didn't work, so let's let it run again. So it's a random method. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Oh, and here we are lucky now. Here you see that after. 8,000 iterations, I'm already done. In this case, oh, I'm much earlier done. So already after 1,000 iterations, I have something like to Lee or dot to Lee. That is the question, whether this and so on. And then after a while, I'm really getting the correct English sentence. So the key here is I could have done a greedy hill climbing, always going up, right? But it's good sometimes to go down as well. So with a certain probability, I do that. Um, Please have a look at the notebook. Why this is also something interesting, so this is something to do with ChatGPT, by the way, if you played around with that one. So behind ChatGPT is a big language model, and the language model is taking text and then generating the next one. And basically, they are having n-gram models for words or n-gram models for um, syllables. Okay, And then they are generating text from that one. But they are not using MCMC. But this kind of way of generating text, basically, that's like related. But that's it for today. Sorry for going over time. Have fun with the notebooks. And next time, I think we look at statistical learning theory. OK. Bye bye.